Welcome to the Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand, owner of the company Horns of Odin. As always, before we start today's show, I do have to plug our Patreon. I know I say it every week, and everybody's probably sick to the back teeth of hearing it, but it is how we keep the lights on, and it's how we keep the podcast going. So it starts from £3 a month, which is 10p a day, works out less than buying me a cup of coffee and what you get is a bonus episode every single week in the form of our q a where basically we sit down with our guest after the main show the patrons get to ask their questions so you can submit them before time or in real time if you get the chance to watch the show and there's always a ton of information that i've missed or mags has forgotten to ask so they are a, a nice little add-on a little extension to the main show so there's an episode you really like, like the one we we did with Joshua Rood on Tia. If you enjoyed that episode, then you get the extra little bit. It's another 15, 20 minutes of the episode. And there are a lot of fun. There's a lot of information there. And then we have story time episodes on top of that. But the best thing to do is just to go over to Patreon forward slash Nordic Mythology Podcast. Check it out. Support if you can. We really do appreciate it. And if not, just a like, share, five-star rating, wherever you get your podcasts always helps maybe somebody new can find the podcast and check us out and get into it but yeah let's get into today's show i'm looking forward to this one so when we put out a a little uh, question every now and then for for guests on the podcast uh this guest came up quite often we got a uh, quite a few requests um so i'm looking forward to, to this uh, so my guest today is Dan Kultas who is an author researcher and living history interpreter and a fellow Yorkshireman. So that is, I feel like that's the top one. That's the most important. Dan, how are you, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. And uh, thanks for having me along on the show. No, you're welcome. Um, so yeah, so you, you're an author, you do research. Are you, do you went to Leeds University? Yeah, that's right. So I did a, an MA uh, in medieval studies at Leeds, which uh, finished last year. Um, specializing in sort of old Norse stuff and that's where my, my dissertation was um because that's always been sort of my main main area of interest mm -hmm. uh is is stuff the scholarly way to describe it because I can never think of what the correct term is when describing just this sphere this like this like thing like what it, stuff is just the word I use very often. I don't know. Is there like a, a scholarly version? <laughs> I mean, there probably is, but it's um, it's a slightly complicated one, isn't it? Because you could say the Viking Age or Viking Age history, but then there's more to it than just that as well, isn't there? It's not just um, that you know. There's all the other sort of areas that that sort of are in and around that so like you know so you your saxon stuff but also i'm saying stuff a lot again aren't i <laughs> but uh, yeah I, I i think stuff's fine i wouldn't write it in a paper but when i'm describing it i think it's a perfectly good word mm -hmm. yeah it's it's all right isn't it um and then living living history interpreter what what's that where, where do you do that yeah so um currently i work at a place called merton park which is just outside york um it's got all sorts of things it's got it's the yorkshire museum of farming we've got a railway um uh, but the area i work in is our school's education program so we've got a early medieval village that we use for viking and saxon we've got a roman fort we've got a stone age village and basically my my day job is a group of kids will will come to us and instead of having a school trip where they like look around a museum we give them a fully immersive day so if they come to the roman fort they join the roman army and we get them you know, using weapons and marching around. Uh, if they do a Viking day, they're a, they're a new settler here in England that's, you know, coming to coming to join our village. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really fun job and, uh, you know, really rewarding teaching kid history in a practical way. Mm -hmm. do, they, do they get to choose what day they get or like what time period in history they get? Yeah, so the, the school will book based on, you know, where they are in the curriculum. So it'll, oh, it'll tie okay, in yeah. with with the topic that they're studying and then the, the say the, the class will come and they get the uh, they get the day is the one that's more popular than the others um rome and viking are our two most popular ones and then all the rest mm -hmm. of them are slightly less popular we're, we're, we've always pretty much got someone on the roman fort and someone in the viking village mm -hmm. how do, do you have to have um like a formal education to get into that or is that just a, a bonus um, 
Officially, no, but almost everyone in the team has got a master's degree in some form of history or museum studies or something like that. So it's not technically a requirement, but we're, we're a pretty well qualified team, actually, when it, mm -hmm. when it comes to it. I guess how, how deep into it can you go? How deep into this stuff can you go when I guess <laughs> when teaching kids? Do you have to keep to like just the basic stuff? Or because I guess, do you have to? I guess walk that line between popular narrative and not getting too nuanced and going, well, everybody thinks this, but actually that's maybe not a hundred percent true. This could maybe be true also. Yeah. I mean, you know, as I say, most of us have got sort of master's degrees in history, but we're pitching at a key stage two level. So to like year three kids. So we have to try and, you know, keep it to the curriculum. Um, but, you know, quite a lot of the time you will get some kids who are really into the topic and they will ask some, you know, quite deep questions. Like you'll be surprised that, you know, a year three kid will ask you something. You're like, wow, how have you even thought of that? Mm -hmm. um, and then that gives you the opportunity to... Sorry, is there one that stands out? No, I was going to say, is there one that stands out? Is there like a, a question that a, that a kid's asked and you're like, wow, how do you, how do you know that? Oh, um trying to think off the top of my head that you see you just sometimes get kids and they they already know pretty much everything um well it's when you know there are some things you put in the talks that you know aren't strictly true but you've just sort of simplified it and a kid will go well actually yeah <laughs> and you're like um, you know, you're eight years yeah. old and you've just well actually to me <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah that's <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be really smart sometimes they'll get you yeah yeah, yeah, they do. They do. Uh, little surprise, yeah. yeah. Um, how often do you get the days of the week and named after the gods? Oh, that yeah, that comes up a lot. Um, generally, we mention that at the, we have a bit of a talk that they have at the uh, at the start of of the day, and that comes up. Um, I always start by asking them what they already know about the Vikings, and it's it's always really refreshing when one of the first things they say is they didn't have horns on their helmets. I'm like, good, mm -hmm. we're, we're starting from a good place here. Yeah. Um, but, but but we see again that like, that's one of those moments where it's like they didn't have horns on their helmets, but maybe well, it's a yeah. <laughs> setting yes. they could have had horns on their helmets. Yeah, yeah, but um, you know, just the fact that they they're not assuming horned helmets is the default is a is a good place. Um, yeah yeah I, I did once have a kid also because we we say about linda's farm being the first raid and you know just because that's the simplified version and i did once have a, a year four kid say oh well what about uh portland so it's like okay oh well, that's good <laughs> yeah how, how many how many was there or were there before linda's farm I, I feel like was the iona one so well there's the there's the recorded one that's mentioned in the anglo-saxon chronicle which is down sort of portland weymouth kind of way but whether that was actually a raid or it was just a misunderstanding um mm -hmm. i do think linda's farm was probably the first one that was like planned as a raid um mm -hmm. but there's, was there it was the loads of distractions was it the first mainland one i know it's not necessarily your area <laughs> Well, and also, do you count Lindisfarne as mainland? It's mainland about half the time, isn't it? Some, half the time. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That is a good point. Depends so, on the time I think of day they come. Yeah, it's, it's from what we can tell from the sources, it's like the first planned raid that was just a raid and not just kind of a, a misunderstanding or a, an, an opportunistic thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I keep having this this idea for uh for an instagram post and we will get onto the topic of the of the show today but this yeah. my so 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 anybody who who listened to the start of the show meg the 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 lady the critiqued my my background is actually my best friend um and I, i've moved i've moved my little setup around so it looks a little bit different for anybody watching this i've got i've got a desk and i, I feel like being sat upright in a chair like a, a, at a desk gives me a little bit more switched on but Meg looks after my social media as well for Horns of Odin. And I keep wanting to write a post uh, basically just titled, Were Vikings Cowards? Uh, and I feel like it would just break the, the little sphere of this. And it's all kind of about this idea of how everybody has this, you know, this, this thought the Vikings were big, tough uh, warriors, which, you know, they, they probably were. You know, they, they had many successful battles. But they also did attack a lot of lonely places that were full of priests 
and didn't have any armed men. And yeah, they were opportun- opportunistic. And obviously, I don't think they were cowards, but it's just this idea of the challenging the narrative that it's like, oh, well, they were super like honorable when in reality, a lot mm-hmm. of it was just kind of snatch and grab attacks at unarmed places against, you know, demilitarized population. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the way we uh, we, we just sort of explain it to the kids in the talk is I get one kid up and I make them a, a princess and I give them gold and a load of guards. And then I have another kid that's the monk with no guards. And then I get a third kid and said, right, you're the Viking. Are you going to go and attack her with all her guards? Or are you going to go and attack that monk who's got just as much money? No guards can't fight back. And they always pick mm-hmm. the monk. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. All, last thing to touch on, I think, is author. So tell me a little bit about your books. Yeah, sure. So um, I've written quite a few books now, um, some as sort of solo projects, some as collaborations. Um, my first one I did was called The God's Own County, A Heathen Prayer Book. Um, that came about, so I'm part of the Asatru community. Um, I lead rituals and stuff, and there weren't a lot of resources around for sort of books on ritual. Um, so I just started making my own notes and one day someone said I should make it into a book. So I did. Um, and then it's just been blew my mind how successful it was. You know, I said, if it sells 50 copies, I'll count that as a success. Um, it's now currently sold about 2,500 across the world. Oh, so nice. yeah. So, um, really, yeah, that was my first one. Um, and then I've done a fair few since, um, the one most relevant to our topic today I've got with me, that's heathenry in the sea uh so right. that is all about um as you'd expect sort of the relationship between uh people historically and modern as well that sort of follow the norse gods and their relationship with the sea um so yeah again that one's a more you know sort of an academic book sort of a study of uh, people's relationship with the sea um yeah i've done uh, my latest book i did with someone called sif brooks um and that mm-hmm. is basically a follow-up to the prayer book it's called the weird less woven an alternative even prayer book and that sort of looks at rituals to deities that might not necessarily be the first ones you think of so that you know there's some quite what might be considered controversial ones in there you know there's there's things for Serta and Jormungandr and and things like that but I mean to me I think I'll, I'll touch on later when we're talking about sea deities is trying to define a deity in an old Norse concept context is difficult in itself so with that book we just kind of opened it up and went you know anything that could conceivably could be considered a deity will will include them so mm-hmm. yeah wonderful yeah I think the, I think st- People wanted to hear you on here with Sif at some point, so we can sort that out as well. We'll get we'll hook that up in the future and talk about that. Yeah, that'd be that'd be really cool. And Sif is a great person to get on the on the podcast. She is bringing out a book. I think it's going to be out just before you, um, which is her book on the Valkyries. And uh, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, sort of have a, a pre-read of that because I've written the foreword for it. And it, it's very, very good. Very, very well written. So, yeah, she'd be an excellent guest to get on. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Yeah, let's, we'll do it. Um, okay, let's get into <clears throat> let's get into the sea deities. So you said it, it runs through into kind of more modern paganism as well because I think we, we touched on this before we started. You... Uh, part of Alsa True UK. What position do you take there? Um, so my official role, I'm the general secretary. So I deal with all the admin and the paperwork and all the boring stuff. Um, oh, all the fun stuff, yeah. All the all the all the great stuff. <laughs> um, but I do also lead a lot of the rituals and do a lot of the spiritual side of it as well. Um, so sort of opening and closing rituals at big festivals. Um, I do uh, rituals specifically to water deities um, and all okay. sorts of things like that. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, we'll we'll tie that in. I want to hear a little bit more about that. But let's start yeah, with yeah. <laughs> um, a basic introduction to sea deities and uh, like, I don't know whether you class as a pantheon, the Norse pantheon, the Norse mythology, the Norse religion, however you want to label it. What, what are we looking at? Because I can think of two off the top of my head. Obviously, you get Njord and then Ran. Um, those are the two that I can just kind of think of. So do you want to maybe t- let's start with those two and tell us a little bit about about them? 
Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the those two, and I think the third one would be Aegir, which is um, Ran's husband, are sort of the three... Okay, yeah, I'm with, yeah. Yeah, they're the three sort of main, what you'd consider the most sort of traditional um, sea deities within an Old Norse pantheon, sort of based on on the Eddic sources and the sagas and the things that we've got. Um, their domains are slightly different, Um oh. And again, and as you well know, it's come up in a lot of things um, within sort of, we'll call it a pantheon for today. <laughs> within the Norse pantheon, the, a, a deity doesn't tend to just be the god of this or the god of that, do they? They, they tend yeah. to be pretty multifaceted. Um, and the same goes with those three sort of sea deities. Um, so Njord is a Vanic deity. So he comes from the Vanir, so the other family of gods to the Aesir. Um, he comes to Asgard as part of the hostage agreement at the end of the Aesir Vanir War, um, and he's you know he's sort of described in several sources as the god of the sea, um, but his influence seems to be mostly around sort of coastal areas. Um, he represents sort of the prosperity of the sea, so he's an important deity for fisher folk. Um, people operating in coastal areas, stuff like that. Um, as I say, sort of the wealth that you can get from the sea. Um, so important for traders as well, um, that side of things. Um, he is the, the father of uh, Frey and Freya as well, two, um, two important deities within the Pantheon, also obviously uh, Vanic deities. Um, so that's sort of... Yeah, very, very basic overview of Njord. I'm sure we can go into a bit more depth on him in a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Ran, um, so she is the goddess of the deep. Um, so less about your sort of coastal areas and your shoreline and very much sort of the deep ocean. Um, so sort of side tangent, she's really important to me um, because of another element of my background, which I've not touched on yet, but um, I was a submarine warfare officer for 13 years before leaving the Navy. Um, so I would spend a lot of time in the deep. Um, so <laughs> she's really, really important to me personally. Um, is that what is that what drew you to these deities and to write a book about these in general, or did you have an interest in these before? Yeah, it was it was mainly my sort of my naval career and and you know spending time at sea and particularly under the sea that that meant that sort of sea deities were some of the most important ones to me. It's very much yeah why I wrote the book. Um, mm -hmm. It was the old cliche of the book I wanted to exist didn't exist, so I wrote it. <laughs> so that's sort of where where that came from. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so sort of looking back at the the source material on on Ran, she's a really really interesting deity because she she is listed by Snorri amongst the goddesses, but she's generally considered to be a Jotun, so a giant, depending on how you want to sort of describe that group mm -hmm. of of beings. Um, but unlike the vast majority of the Jotnar, um, she there were lots of attestations of offerings being made to her. Um, generally, Jotnar are sort of the bad guys, for want of a better term, in the mythology, mm -hmm. and we don't find a lot of evidence of humans honouring them. Um, but yeah, Rand's quite different. There's plenty of attestations of offerings to her. Now, they generally are as a, more of a kind of appeasement. Um, so you offer to Rand so she doesn't drown you, uh, okay. <laughs> because um, yeah, her as opposed name. To I was going to say, sorry, as opposed to asking for something. Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of a, instead of a, yeah, like a gifting cycle as it generally is with most of the sort of the Aesir and the Vanir where you're, you know, either thanking them for something or asking them for something. This is a kind of a, a, a please don't kill me <laughs> generally. Mm. Um, so her name can translate as thief or taker. Um and we're told in the Eddic sources that she has a net that she uses to drag sailors to the deep. Yeah, offerings to Ran generally to sort of appease her and stop her from drowning you. Um, because I say her name can be translated as thief or taker. Um, so there is the idea that she she takes sailors in her net. 
Um, but I would say sort of on the flip side of that is it's well attested that as long as you are respectful of her and ideally have some gold to offer to her once you're down in her hall, um, that she is a good hostess. So this isn't a case of she takes you and then, you know, you have a horrible afterlife. It's a case of she takes you and then as long as you respect her, then you actually have quite a nice afterlife. Um, as long as, and, long as you've got the money, it seems. Yeah, as long as, you, as, long, as long as you can pay for it, you can have a good afterlife with mm -hmm. Fran. Um, you, and the fact... Do you think that... Sorry, so, sorry my, my mind... This is how my mind works at like 100 mile an hour. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Do you think that there's any link to like this idea of buried treasure because you know like when you think of buried treasure you think of like gold maybe pirates and you like the little chests of gold and that kind of thing do you think there's any any kind of mm. link to that of this idea of, of the the ships that had been reared in they were maybe full of gold and silver that they taken and when it's kind of pulled down as long as you've got a ship full of kind of booty then maybe she's going to leave you alone yeah, I think there probably is something there because there's this connection between gold and the sea that runs sort of throughout cultures throughout the world. Um, this isn't just a just a Norse thing. Um, there's a whole load of like kennings for Ran and her relatives that include gold. Um, you know, her hall is said to be lit with gold. Um, so yeah, I think there definitely is something there, and it might be you know that that's had an influence on sort of perceptions of the sea later on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. perfect okay so is that is that us done with with ran is there anything else we kind of need just on a on a broad introduction um i think that that covers it for ran on an introduction um so we can move on to her husband mm -hmm. um, so her husband is agir um now again it's not entirely clear where he sits from the sort of the written sources as to you know what family he comes from again generally he's sort of lumped in with the giants the Jotnar. um but his relationship with the gods again is very very different to most of the Jotnar. so most of the Jotnar that we come across in in the mythological sources are generally being hit on the head with thor's hammer and that's about their their contribution there there is sort of a an antagonist um whereas Aegir, very very different he is the host of the gods so whenever they want to have a big party, uh, they head to his hall. Um, and his relationship with the gods, even though he is a sea deity, and you know his hall is that he shares with Ran is below the waves, his interaction with the other gods is based more on his role as a brewer. Uh, so he's the master brewer that can make all the best beer and the best mead and host all the best parties. Um, and obviously, Ran plays a part there as the hostess as well. Wonderful. Um... Yeah, so uh, I've just lost the, the comment. Oh, so Ida said that Ran still means, ro still means robbery in Norwegian and no one will name mm -hmm. their child after her like they do Freya or Idun. Mm. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, so um, with Aegir, um, I heard this, this little theory years ago, and I don't know if there's anything to it, um, but maybe you, you'll have heard it. Maybe, maybe not. I, and it, it 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 relates to that little symbol behind you on that shield, mm. um, and this idea of that in in Fafnir's hall you have the uh, I guess it's Egishmala or however you, the best way to pronounce it. Um, yeah. And I I had a theory which would be the Helm of War to anybody listening who couldn't understand my terrible pronunciation. Um, this this idea that this is a helm or Aegir's helm, like his helmet, um, that is a part of the treasure. I, have you ever heard of that kind of theory? I, I I saw it once, and this was years ago on Facebook. I will admit it. So it might it probably didn't come from the the best of sources. Um, yeah, I have heard it. Um, I've not been able to trace it to anything sort of from the Viking age. Um, and I'm sure this has come up before, but like the, the earliest attestation of that symbol that I've got on my drum behind me is actually way, way later. Um, so it, it gets used by a lot of people as a Viking mm -hmm. symbol, but historically, I think it's sort of 16th century before we have it actually sort of recorded anywhere. Um, that doesn't mean though, that it's not connected to a gear. Um, it could be because, um, you know, as, 
we've kind of touched on already in the chat um the influence of these deities continued long after they were sort of strictly worshipped um you know Aegir survives in folklore Ran survives in folklore Njord survives in folklore so it there could be a connection there um I've not managed to to find it but I mean linguistically just to look at it it sounds like it could make sense um mm -hmm. but yeah I'd, I'd have to do a bit more uh, a bit more of a dive there to find out yeah I would love to know if there's anything to it because I think it would be quite quite cool um when it comes to sea deities and I guess offerings you mentioned ran and this idea of offering to prevent something do we see any kind of offerings to uh, the obvious one would be like yomanganda this this you know the, the the serpent in the sea do we see anybody giving things of like fuck off leave us alone here's like a, a sheep or something no not as far as i'm aware i've not come across any offerings in a historical context i'm sure people do it now um but in a historical context i've not seen anyone offering to jormungandr or you know or to fenrir his brother um so ran kind of sits in this middle ground where mm -hmm. she's not considered in the same way as other goddesses are where you'd have a normal sort of gifting cycle thing going on but she's also not in this category of like they're really bad we just try and leave them alone and try not to get their attention she sits in this kind of middle area whereby we have kind of know that we've got to appease her because you know if we're going to use the sea we need to keep her on side um, whereas I think with Jormungandr, maybe the idea is there's nothing you can do to keep him on side. If he wants to attack you, he's just going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, so when, when we talk about people who were so reliant on the sea, whether it was external trade, external raiding, or even just kind of moving around their own land, you know, a lot of the populated areas in Norway are on the coast. It's the easiest way to kind of get around. It's such a relation to the sea. Yet, the really famous gods that we know from this this pantheon, if we you know if we're going to call it that for the episode, mm. um, none of them are like sea gods. You know, you have like Loki, the the tricks are like Odin. You have Thor. They're like the big ones. Then you actually get hymned out, and maybe these are the ones that were picked up by Marvel. So maybe that's why they've yeah. they, they've you know superseded and gone into this this next kind of level of fame. But I think it's odd that most people would know, say Poseidon, um, and I wonder why you know for people who are so connected to the sea, why maybe that that one god just isn't the pillar or isn't like really up there on that kind of top tier. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I think um, you might actually be onto something where you say that because Marvel don't have a, a Njord in the in the in their universe, that that's why today maybe he's not as popular. Um, but historically, there are a lot of um, places along the coast of Norway that have Njord as an element in the name, um, and that's okay. generally a good way of seeing you know how well someone was worshipped at the time by if they have places named after them and there are lots of places with new orders and elements so i think he probably was in the viking age sort of up there um not maybe not on your same tier as thor and odin um but i mm. think he was very much seen as an important deity um i think he was offered to regularly um and with him it was much more of your sort of your standard you know, you're, you're having a gifting cycle, you're asking him, you're thanking him, rather than this sort of appeasement level with Ran. So he's more sort of what you think of as like a traditional deity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he comes from the Varnir, so that that sort of second family after the Aesir. So he, he's, he's up there. He's quite often described as being the head of that family as well. He's uh, one of his kennings is Elder Van. Um, so, yeah, I think he was you know, in the Viking age, very, very popular. Why that hasn't sort of stuck through in, you know, into modern times, anyone's guess. Um, as you say, the fact that Marvel don't include him could well be part of it. Mm -hmm. And then before we take a, a deeper look into, into, I guess, those three or, or any of the gods, what about, I guess, gods like Thor, where 
you know, if we if you're ever watching a popular TV show when they're sailing across the the North Sea to come raid England, and it gets a little bit choppy, uh, the, the the weather turns, it gets thunder and lightning, and the the, the ship's going to capsize. Automatically, there's this there's this prayer to to Thor or this offering to Thor, this idea that Thor's going to be the one that saves you. So, you, do you get that connection with the sea, or is it just the you tend to get the bad weather, so therefore it kind of makes that link. Yeah, so Thor is a really interesting one. And in my book, I actually argue that Thor should be considered as a sea god as well. Um, now, obviously, okay. he's the god of many other things. As we say, they're, they're multifaceted. You know, it, the first thing you think of with Thor is obviously hammer, thunder, that sort of stuff. But he has got a really strong connection with the sea. And as you say, in the sagas... And um, that comes up a lot. And when they're doing that in sort of modern TV adaptations, that that's not just something they're doing for TV. Like a lot of the sagas, they do pray to Thor in storms. And um, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is there's the story where Thor and his servants and Loki um, end up doing some contests with some giants. Um one of which is Thor has to drain a giant drinking horn. And no matter how good he is at drinking, we all know Thor can put it away, uh, but he can't drain the horn. And then it turns out that the other end of that horn is in the sea. And every time mm -hmm. he takes yeah. a drink, it uh, creates the tides. So he is yeah. directly attested as being the god of the tides. So if you've got a big storm and the sea's being all whipped up, you could see that as you know something that Thor's got an influence on. Um, mm -hmm. there's several sources that attest him being able to have an influence over the wind as well as thunder. So again, in a storm, that's really important. Um, but also he, in a lot of the stories, he kind of personifies mankind's relationship with the sea. Um, so he's got obviously this long standing running battle going on with Jormungandr. Um, We've got the story where he goes on what gets referred to as Thor's fishing trip, um, where he goes and tries to catch Jormungand, and he's there in the yeah. boat as the fisherman. Um, and that can be seen as sort of um, an image of, you know, mankind's relationship with the sea. So if you're in a situation where it looks like the sea's starting to win that battle, then you call on the champion of mankind, and that's Thor. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think Thor has a massive connection with the sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it kind of comes naturally, doesn't it? If you're, you know, in the middle of the ocean and when the weather turns and there is that risk to your your, your ship being capsized, it, you're going to tend to get that that wind, the the thunder, the lightning. They're going to come in with that, so it's mm -hmm. going to be natural that you're going to kind of look to look to Thor. But <clears throat> I never thought of it in a in a sense of those stories of Thor linking to. The sea, like you said, with the fishing for the mm. Midgard serpent and the Udgard to Loki drinking the the horn. I, yeah, I never really thought of it in that sense of mm. how they the, you have those two stories to it. And um, yeah, it's very very interesting. Uh, and then I guess the the last ones I, that I wanted to kind of check on. I probably should have done this in a better order. Um, <laughs> The, the 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 daughters of Aegir. Is there anything to that? I've heard this idea before. I'm trying to kind of remember off the top of my head. Are they like the 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 waves or something? Or this yeah, idea that, is that is that true or is that like a modern thing? No, no, that is um, that's attested in I think in Snorri. Um, so the daughters of Aegir and Run are the nine waves. Um, so they are uh, attested in i think you say i think it's snorri um as and they've got names like wave cool wave transparent on top uh, i'm saying them in english rather than old norse because my pronunciation's not great either um, but yeah so they are you know considered to be the nine waves um and what i find really interesting about that is um quite often um you'll see the way that waves work is generally they do come in sets of nine so you'll get sort of eight smaller waves and then one one big one so the way this so that that sort of that idea of them being the nine waves is kind of reflected in how waves tend to work oh wow okay that's yeah that's really interesting i see i'm not lucky enough to have ever really lived by the sea 
and I know like this is generalizing, but like sea people that, that I by sea people I mean people who live you know by the sea love it. Help, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, but they no, but they like love it. Like, I know people who like mm-hmm. live by the sea, and they're like, I could never live anywhere, but by the sea. And and I do get it. Like, when you're by a big open body of water, there is this kind of connectiveness and just this openness to the the kind of the vast mm. of the of the ocean. Um, but I've never, yeah, I've never been around it enough to kind of count the waves. Um, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's that's really interesting. That that that's something they probably have just picked up on because i imagine that's not changed mm. in the last thousand years yeah yeah i mean i assume the uh the physics of waves works the same now as it did then um no, yeah it's... Thor, thor drank thor drank the horn and that's well, how that's it true. works and th- and that's how it works now so it, it's not gonna exactly. change is it <laughs> exactly <laughs> um yeah it's interesting that sort of what you're saying about sort of you know people who who have that connection with the sea and and live by the sea um you know feel it so deeply um again i mm-hmm. talk about that a bit in my book as well but i mean one theory that i've got is that you know our bodies are 90 percent water so does that right. mean that you know we've got that sort of kinship with large bodies of water because we are mainly water ourselves um mm-hmm. yeah yeah yeah, it's yeah. There is a, a connectiveness, there, isn't there? Um, so the last, has it, has it been funny? Hopefully, it's no. I think I've still got you. See, yeah, you're still here. You're still. Yeah, here. I'm still. Here. Um, <laughs> the the last one that that comes to mind, one that I picked up on, and I have no idea if it's real because I've never heard of this before. Is the a deity to do with waterfalls is it saga is that Ooh, yeah is is that a again because i don't know of it i've never spoke about it on the podcast before i'm kind of a bit apprehensive of whether it's like just modern stuff that's been written or whether it's an actual deity no no, so Saga definitely has a connection um, with with water. So her hall, the name of it translates as Sunken Bench. Um, so she again, she's multifaceted. Um, so she's one of Frigga's handmaidens. Um, she is the goddess of history, storytelling, you know, hence the name Saga, literally Saga. Um, but yeah, she sort of lives in Fenlands. Her hall is called Sunken Bench. Um, and there's several attestations of Odin going and sitting and drinking mead with her by the water. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely a, a connection with its sort of its basis in the in the uh, in the law. Mm-hmm. Is that about it? Is that all we all we know? Because I know with a, with a lot of this stuff, we tend to get a sentence, yeah. maybe <laughs> in Snoria, and then that's it. And then people somehow manage to write theses on a <laughs> sentence yeah i mean certainly when you get sort of as far down the sort of pecking order as individual handmaidens of frigga unfortunately generally yeah we get like two or three lines um mm-hmm. and that's all you've got to go on and then you kind of you know if you want to sort of extrapolate from that and build up your own ideas fine but what we've actually got written down about saga that's about it yeah um do we see any any deities when it comes to um ri- like rivers and lakes you know like inland bodies mm. of water rather than the sea and the ocean yeah well i suppose saga could be one cuz she sort of fenlands and you know that sort of thing but generally it's more sort of water sp- spirits now again as i said earlier the line between what's a deity and what's not a deity you know who knows um but there's generally this idea in the norse sources and and obviously a lot later folklore and things like that that everywhere has its own sort of spirit um so you you know your um your water whites i suppose you'd want to want to call them um some of those can be friendly some of them could be less friendly generally as a rule water whites are less friendly than land spirits um but i suppose that kind of makes sense because generally bodies of water are more dangerous than land as a general rule mm. you know if you if you fall asleep in a field then 
nine times out of 10, you'll be okay. If you fall asleep in a river, you probably won't. Um, so, you know, it's kind of this idea that you've got to be really careful around them. Um, and you get things in things like um, Scottish folklore where you've got like the water horse, that if you're, if you're not careful around sort of fast flowing water, then the water horse will come and get you and drag you down to the deep. Um, I quite like that example because they use it in Frozen. Um, and they actually oh, do it. They? Well, I think it's Frozen 2. Um, they have the the Nock, which is um, the Scandinavian water horse spirit. Um, and the way it's portrayed in Frozen 2 is actually pretty uh, pretty spot on to the folklore. So, um, yeah, I quite like that example. Um, uh, that, sounds a, that sounds a bit heavy for Frozen 2. But... It does, doesn't it? Yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> but i've not seen it so i don't know yeah well the, the i've only seen it once um, but the princess character the the horse tries to drag her underwater uh but she's able to tame it and ride it and then it does her bidding and that follows the sort of folklore around it perfectly oh, this right. idea that if you're strong enough you can tame the water horse but you have to be like a hero to be able to do that oh, oh very avatar yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, what about like place names when it comes to to these gods do we see a uh, locks obviously that's i guess an idea of you can tell how popular they were you know you get tons for thor not that many for odin i guess uh i think is there like a couple maybe for tia do you do you get many for like Njord? So you get quite a lot for Njord. Uh, as I say, all around sort of the coastal areas of Norway, you do get quite a few for Njord. Um Is it mainly Norway? Because I get yeah. that would give us an idea of maybe whether he whether he's just like a because obviously again, I think people need to remember that there is no dogma for this. There isn't like mm. a set rule of these gods are for this. It's a it's a living, breathing religion that that travels across and transcends a huge time period, a huge geographical landscape. So what people in Norway believe could be very different to what people in Denmark and Sweden believe, or like just slight variations on it. So it gives that indication of maybe Njord was just more of a Norway based kind of water god. And, and that doesn't come into maybe Sweden and Denmark the same. Yeah. Um, so I, from what I remember, I think most of the place names for Njord are the Norwegian coast sort of in and around the fjords. Um, there might be the odd one scattered in Denmark and Sweden. I don't think there's any in Iceland. I can't think of any in the British Isles. So predominantly Norway, I think, for uh, for Njord's place names. And then Aegir and Ran, I I don't think there are any at all. There might there's a few for Aegir, but um, I'm not sure I you know follow them. I think it's sort of a reaching a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What about? Um, archaeological finds. Do we see anything like that again? You know, when you get these ship burials in particular, you would assume that at a ship burial, would there be some sort of offering to a, sh a sea based deity? Yeah, um, I suppose. I mean, you'd argue that the ship itself could well be the symbol there. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that you know going back to we were talking earlier about how important the sea is for for those cultures um and the fact that people are choosing to be buried in a ship you know they're not being buried in a cart they're not being buried in a symbolic representation of a longhouse they're being buried in a ship um so that's you know that shows just how central the sea is to their sort of worldview their understanding um and sort of symbols associated with Njord are obviously ships themselves, um, gold and fish. Um, so it would be hard in a grave to see, to point at something and say that's been put in there for Njord because the ship mm -hmm. itself is the ship. Um, if they put fish in there, we do find fish bones in graves. They could have been in there for Njord or they could have just been in there as something for the deceased to eat on their journey. Um, well, and hard to place gold as well. It's interesting you said that, and I was just pulling this up. So I spoke to, I'm going to butcher his his name, so I do apologize, Christian. Christian Loxen, uh, I'm going to try and pronounce this, Rodstrud. Listen to the episode, Max says it's so much better than me. But Christian <laughs> looked after um, 
he, he was in charge of a few of the sea um the ship burial on an archaeological side um mm. the excavations of them and he was telling us of one of the most interesting things that he thought that he found and this was in the patron episode so if you if you want to hear this this little bit check out the the patron extra q a that we did with christian and he was telling us about this little bone that they found from a fish and he was saying that it was if anybody in the chat room is better than than me i think it was three foot it was like a big thought it came from like a big fish but it'd been completely mm. overlooked when they i think it was from the yellowstad uh excavation and it was only like a, a small bone but they they thought that that's where it came from this huge fish that had been put in there and for him it, this was like a really cool mm. find the fact that this was in there and i i wondered kind of why we didn't see loads of fish or why it was kind of why it seems somewhat uncommon to have this fish in there because i guess from for me from not you know from the not an archaeological standpoint just you have a, a you know a group of people who live and and do a lot by the sea um i would have just thought there would have been tons of fish thrown in there like to bulk up the burial <laughs> a little bit like get some fish in there you've got horses dogs everything i was like yeah throw some big fish in um, but I, yeah, it just stood out that he, he said that this little fish board was, yeah, I think Demery is right that it was a halibut. Um, mm. and I'm sure he said it was like three feet. They reckon it was. Mm. I mean, there's a few, a few things there. I mean, one, it could be that, you know, you're putting in this particularly big fish, you know, that's quite an important, you know, mm -hmm. you don't get a, a three foot halibut every time you go fishing, do you? So yeah. And, uh, it, and it's yeah. a resource, isn't it? Somebody could eat it. If you're going to, yeah. again, we, we said on the episode, you know, if you're willing to put something in there. And it's, you know, you're taking it away from the population to put it in there and effectively let it rot. Mm. Um, it has to be a, a real belief. Yeah, definitely. Um, you have to, you put it in there for a reason. Um, whether that reason is the person that you're burying really likes fish, so you've given him a massive mm -hmm. fish, or it is a connection to Njord. Um, you know, only the people that did it can tell you that. Um, something I would say, though, is in terms of, you know, we're saying, why don't we see more of it? um fish bones are generally small and soft compared to like a horse bone or something like that and yeah. they're not very good at surviving archaeologically just in general you need the like mm -hmm. the right soil conditions for fish bones to survive um mm -hmm. so it could be that loads of the other graves did have fish in there it's just that there's you know there's just nothing left because fish bones just don't survive very well mm -hmm. yeah i think that's that's probably the case um we're we're not far off an hour to be honest Blimey. <laughs> what about what about when it, it seems as though Njord is the the kind of the bigger of the sea deities you i guess he would be the one at the top am i right well it's the way i see it is he is sort of the god of the coast um, whereas Ran and Aegir are, are the deities of the deep ocean. Um, that's kind mm -hmm. of how I draw the distinction. So on a day-to-day -day basis, most people are going to see or interact with Njord more because most of the time you're not crossing the ocean, are you? You're just going out fishing, mm -hmm. you're pottering around the coast, so you're going to have more interaction with Njord. Ran yeah. and Aegir come in like when you're on deep sea voyages, you're going a long way out of sight of land. That's kind of their, yeah. their remit. So I guess to, to to you know to make that distinction that everyday Scandinavians living in the Viking Age, they're not going a Viking. They're not going yeah. across the North Sea or the the Baltic Sea. They're not that that's that's not the journey that they're making. They're just yeah. living their life, farming and you know doing their thing. So they're they obviously they still have that connection to the oceans. They're likely going to be connected to Yard because it's the the one that's that's there whereas when you get you know warriors or, or travelers who go further out they're then going to encounter Aegir and ran and which is going to be a much smaller percentage of of the population let's you know yeah. we have to remember that people who actually go raiding it's a it's a small percentage of the people who actually lived in scandinavia this time they weren't all vikings 
Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, as you say, it's it's people going raiding, or you know, your, your famous explorers crossing the Atlantic, and and even then, you know, the, the thought is only really well. Rand's important to me if I drown, whereas Njord can be important to you all the time. Okay, yeah. So Njord can can you can benefit from from gift giving? This culture of yeah. gift giving, you can you know offer him something and get hopefully a three-foot halibut in return. Yeah. <laughs> whereas whereas with the ran it's that, you know, hopefully I'm not gonna I'm not gonna die. It's yeah. it's that idea of once you're in trouble, please yeah. please help me. Yeah. <laughs> um do you think there there's any connection um between Njord and Poseidon and um, oh, who's the um, Neptune? I guess it's it's easy to to make that distinction or that link and just go, oh well, you have like Njord is the the the, the Viking or the Norse like sea god. You have Neptune, you have Poseidon. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all kind of the same thing. Do we see any link between them? Because obviously there are some that link um is it tier with jupiter i think like uh, through yeah and, and mars as well gets linked with tier mm -hmm. um yeah. so yeah so there are um some sort of later roman commentaries and the romans whenever they're writing about like germanic tribes they don't say the germanic name of the deity they just say mm -hmm. oh they worship jupiter and we know it's probably not jupiter it's odin or it's tear and um, and we do get that a sidonius writes that the saxons worship poseidon and um, and that then gives us a couple of problems because one we know it's probably not poseidon it's their own deity um, but we have so few written early Saxon sources that we don't know if he's actually referring to a Saxon equivalent of Njord or a Saxon equivalent of Aegir. Um, mm -hmm. So it could be either of them. Um, or it could mm -hmm. be both, and Sidonius has just wrapped them up nicely into one package and called it Poseidon. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, that, I mean, the Romans were certainly making those connections. They That's basically what they did. They saw other gods and said, oh, well, that's just your version of our god X, Y, or Z. Um, and you know there are some some similarities in in characteristics. Um, you're always going to have you, some I, you know, sea deities. That you you said Aegir was maybe tied um, through the etymo etymology um, rather than Njord, and I was wondering if that would symbolise or show that maybe Aegir was the more popular one than Njord. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. As, as I say, well, this is looking at sort of a late Roman commentator writing about the early Saxons, and this is Saxons before they come to England, you know, proper not, not Anglo-Saxons, but actual Saxon-Saxons. Mm -hmm. And some people have interpreted it as being a gear. Um, but as I say, because we've got so few written sources for the belief, of those Saxons before they convert to Christianity, it really is open to interpretation. It will be a sea deity. You could argue the case for Aegir. You could argue the case for Njord. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it it really is just a case. It could be, could be either one. Yeah. Um. Okay. What about? <laughs> this feels very like Marvel. Uh, like like powers or like strength do we do we get to hear anything about the physical appearance of these gods i mean we get it's we, we don't have much for any of the gods do we really when it comes to physical descriptions you get like little bits but they weren't keen on like writing down big long descriptions on what gods look like and that's why we get so many arguments over yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what I what I Odin lost, or what Thor looks does Thor would Thor be overweight? All these things. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, do we do we get that for Nior? Do we get like told he can like raise the sea up? He can control the fish like Aquaman. Like, is there any like of these things in there? Interestingly, uh, slightly strangely, the one sort of main thing we know about Nyord and his physical appearance is that he has the most beautiful feet of all of the male deities. Um, okay. Yeah. 
which yeah. you might not be expecting, but um, there's the story where Skadi comes to Asgard to get revenge for the death of her father. They negotiate an agreement, and one of the terms is that she can pick a husband from any of the, the male deities, but she's only allowed to look at their feet to choose. And she picks the sexy feet, thinking that they're going to mm -hmm. belong to Balder, uh, but the sexy feet actually belong to Njord. Um, so we, we know he's got some very nice feet, if you're into that uh, sort of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, there you go, maybe. Um, what do you think that tells us? That, um, do, you think it, do you think it's more just like the moral of the story? Is it's rather than telling of New York's feet, it could really be any god. It's more the moral is don't kind of expect one thing or be like really superficial and think that you're going to get it based on something like that. Yeah, I think it probably is that in a large part. I mean, I don't know if there's, I've not sort of come across an idea that sailors or fishermen have particularly nice feet um, from experience of working and living with a lot of sailors. I can't say they've got nice feet. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's kind of the one thing that we're we're told about Njord. Um, we're not really, like, they don't tend to, in the editors that sort of describe sort of powers as such yeah so it's more like we're told they rule over this or they influence this um so you know we can read that as he can control all the little fishies if we want to you know if that's mm -hmm. our interpretation yeah. of rules over um, but it doesn't you know literally say he can raise his arm and the whales will attack you or anything like that mm -hmm. i guess because every every image you ever see of a godlike yard is like this watery figure coming like out of the the ocean. Do you think that's just like a a modern cool representation, or do you think that there's any like basis in like that kind of idea? Yeah. Well, again, you know, we're told so little about their physical description. Um, so with Njord, I'd see him more as sort of being like your traditional fisherman. That's how I see him. How I'd mm -hmm. interpret him. So rather than him coming out of the ocean, he's in the boat. Yeah, just with those sexy feet. With his sexy, sexy just, feet. Yeah, um, he's he's an open toe sandal kind of guy. Oh yes. Um, yeah, he's not he's not covering those up. No. Um Aegir, on the other hand, um, and Ran, they're quite often sort of portrayed, you know, coming out of the ocean. They're more kind of like your I don't know, that sort of maybe sea monster, maybe Aquaman, however you want to sort of mm -hmm. interpret oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I guess if they're dragging things down, it mm. could be that. That yeah. kind of idea. Um, okay, before we wrap up, I wanted to... Uh, what about... Not necessarily deities or gods, but what about monsters? Because the one that fascinates me is always like the Kraken. Because I never mm. think of the Kraken being like a a Norse kind of monster. But it, am I right in that it has its origins? And I don't know if this is something that you know about or come across in your research, but it was always one that I kind of like surprised me enough. It was like, there's a really cool, I don't know why I just assumed it was Greek or something. Yeah, no, the, the Kraken does originally come from, um, from a Norse sort of background. Um, and I mean, actually the Kraken's one of my favorite ones as well. Um, because I would argue that we've now kind of proven that the Kraken is real. Like there mm -hmm. are now giant squids, like giant squid, found they're, they're, like, yeah, they are big. So, all right. Yeah. They're, not like you know tentacles round a ship pulling it down to the deep but the person who originally sort of started the idea of the kraken might have seen one of these giant squids and then it just kind of you know snowballed as these things do um mm -hmm. but yeah it, it is um it does come from a from a scandinavian origin the kraken um obviously your manganders your other big sea monster um that features in you know a lot of the stories as as thor's enemy um so they're kind of uh kind of your two biggest sort of sea monsters yeah i always wonder i would love to know where a lot of these stories originate from because i because people are liars so i guarantee <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that somebody something's happened they've been out on a ship someone's ship's got damaged and they've got back to land and they've gone Rather than admitting that they've bumped a rock on the way in because they didn't mm. read the land properly, they've gone, guys, guess what? Yeah. Giant tentacles. And yeah. I mean, giant. Well, and we only um, just got out. 
<laughs> it's, it's interesting you should say that because, again, one of my favorite facts about sea monsters, the last officially recorded sea monster attack um, where it's gone down as this was done by a monster is 1916 um, in the First World War and a German submarine is officially recorded as destroyed by sea monster attack. So... Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. See, just... Did, did, they, did they say what the sea monster was or just sea monster just sea monster um and then the most of the crew managed to survive and they're picked up by a british ship um but the the german captain is adamant that they've not been you know they weren't sunk by a torpedo this isn't enemy action they haven't hit a rock and the british captain describes it as you know these guys like had like a thousand yard stare and like you know he was convinced that they had seen this monster um <laughs> so yeah you know a hundred years ago these stories are still being told and believed yeah but again they're just lying they just don't want to lose face that they've been shot by a toppy uh, well, and they had a thousand yeah. yards stare because they their little thing <laughs> cannon under the water just been hit yeah. by a torpedo i mean i would it doesn't matter whether it's a sea monster or a little propelled rocket i'm terrified if i get hit on the water in a, in a little can well yeah but and you know uh, as a sailor i can confirm sailors love to exaggerate and tell a good story and i don't well, that, yeah <laughs> well you have that you i guess you have that experience from you know from doing what you did um you know a different experience to a lot of us where you're in a confined space with and i imagine i don't know do you get phone signal down there can you like be no <laughs> exactly no. So, so so you're you're completely cut off so you kind of get this heightened experience of hanging out with like a a, a bunch of people and I don't know what how much you get for entertainment, but I imagine you get this com camaraderie. But also, this do, do you get this sense of like storytelling, like it used to be, where you'd all just hang out and just tell stories, and it, then you want to entertain, so you kind of conflate them and maybe tell them again, and you you twist them just to make them a little bit better. Oh yeah, definitely. On long submarine patrols where, you know, you're not seeing the sun for months at a time, you've got no communication with the outside world. Your mind goes a bit weird. I won't lie. <laughs> like it gets a yeah. bit strange down there. Um, and you know, that is an environment that's going to foster this sort of storytelling. Um, and I, I know like, you know, for, for our Viking ancestors, obviously it's not the same. They're not under the water in a tin can, but they're still, you know, away from their families, away from their villages um can't see land you know the mind wanders and you come up with things and you might see a bird and go ah it's the kraken <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just you know your, your mind does yeah. strange things when you're in these isolated environments yeah and it's just it's a good story let's not yeah pretend that like being able to tell a good story you've been on this amazing trip you've you've gone see new lands you've raided some um unarmed monks and stolen their their gold you come back like it just adds to it doesn't it if you snuck past a sea monster on the way and nobody can tell yeah. you you're lying because those fuckers are going out in the sea that's nobody it. can check <laughs> that's it so nobody can you, check. Can, you can get away with it because then nobody yep. can tell you that, that it didn't happen <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's, <laughs> let's let's wrap this up. We've done about hour fifteen. I want to let the patrons ask you some questions, and I want to. I'm going to save this for the Q and A because I want to ask you about how, in modern times, we could um, maybe offer rituals to to these gods, mm -hmm. and how you how you do it, and how others do it. So, if you want to hear the answer to that, do go and join our Patreon and get the Q and A episode, which is at Patreon forward slash Naughty Mythology Podcast. Like I say, that's from three pound a month less than a cup of coffee um i know we say it a lot but it helps us keep the show going it literally keeps the show going so if you can support please do uh dan where can people follow you where can they get your books um like i said we'll do this again we'll get you on with sif and we'll have a, a nice chat over that book as well yeah that'll be fantastic um so uh, all of my books are available on amazon um, so if you just put Dan Coltus into Amazon, you'll be able to see all my books there. Uh, my, my Instagram is the God's Own County. Um, so follow me on Instagram. Um, I do have Facebook and I do have a page on there as an author, but I, I, I hate Facebook. I very rarely go on it. So mm -hmm. Instagram's yeah. the better place. Instagram and okay. yeah, Amazon if you want to buy the books. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. Um, if you want to follow me, it's Daniel underscore Farron one. That's my personal, obviously, obviously Horns of Odin. If you want to check out all the stuff we do on there. And then it's Nordic Mythology Podcast across the board, uh, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. If you want to see our faces, all the episodes are recorded. We put a video up there. Um, you can see my new little setup if you want to see what my lovely friend Meg was taking the piss out of at the start. Um, but I like it. I've, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, Dan, it's been lovely talking to you. We would definitely do this again, obviously. As a fellow Yorkshireman, it's always nice, and we could we can definitely try and do do one in person. I think that would be lovely. Just sit down, we'll we'll have a beer and chat some more about this kind of stuff. To put it, yeah, uh, a throwback. <laughs> well, yeah, well, thanks very much for for having me. Um, always happy to talk about sea deities, um, but very happy to talk about a plethora of other topics as well. Um, and yeah, me mm -hmm. being up and doing it in person over, over a horn of something would be fantastic. Wonderful. Oh, that that's for only Dan's is that. <laughs> <laughs> right. On that note, let's, let's, let's wrap this up. Um, Dan, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.